Good evening TCF Church family, it is Wednesday the 28th of November, 28th of November, 28th of April, it's uh, times all merging into one but obviously you can see by the sun shining it's definitely not November. And welcome to another uh, 260 devotion at 7 and tonight we're going to be continuing our story of David with a look at 2 Samuel from chapter 1 through to the end of chapter 12. Just a reminder that we will be meeting in our building on Sunday and we are looking at John, uh, Luke chapter 3, the baptism of Jesus and Peter Ferguson, one of our members, is going to be preaching for us this morning. So I would encourage you to, to join with us this Sunday if you can and, and enjoy fellowship and uh, time together and, and we'll also obviously be streaming that live uh, as well because we're still a wee bit limited in terms of the number of people we can get in the building. Before we come to Second Samuel, let's pray, shall we? Father, I thank you that your word is here to guide us, to direct us, to be a light to our paths and a lamp unto our feet. Help us to learn from it this evening, for I ask this in the Lord's name. Amen. So last week we were looking at David and Goliath and David's interaction with Saul and Saul passes away at the end of 1 Samuel. He ends badly. He continues to ignore God's commandments and God's laws. He conducts or he seeks the advice of a medium and God is very unhappy. And Saul is cut off and David is made king. And in the early part of 2 Samuel, in the first four chapters, David just enjoys success after success, victory after victory in battle, because his relationship with God was such that he maintained that close relationship and he did what God said and he did what God wanted him to do. And he makes Jerusalem the city. And in 2 Samuel chapter 6, we hear that the ark is being taken from where it was resting to Jerusalem and as they were carrying the ark one of the oxen stumbled and the ark was going to fall and this person called Uzzah reaches out to try and save the ark and he is struck dead now when we look at this we think really he 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 was doing what was right he was trying to protect the ark he was doing a good thing and we can find it difficult to understand. And we have to say, well, why is this specifically recorded? Why does this story make it into our word, uh, God's word that has been preserved for us? Well, what we see in this is God is not like us. The Ark of the Covenant was a, was a thing that was deemed holy by God. The, the stone tablets that God had written and put his law on rested in the ark. The ark was kept within the tabernacle in a holy encampment and a holy enclosure. The presence of the ark was only accessed in a very limited way. And what God is saying here is that his standard, his holiness is completely different from what we think is right, what we think is best. And so, while we find the story difficult, we have to remind ourselves that God's holiness, God's character is such that we dare not come close. We dare not be in the presence of it or touch it. For it will consume us and destroy us because we are sinful. We are excluded from the presence of God. Now this is important as we continue on the story. And David in response to this is scared and he thinks how can I bring the ark to a place? This is too powerful. And in second chapter, uh, second Samuel chapter 7. The Lord sends Nathan to speak to David, Nathan the prophet. And he tells David, because David has decided he's going to build a temple for the ark. 
And God says to him, essentially, have I ever asked for a temple? Have I ever asked for a house? My presence has been within the tent. That is what I specified. And it is not your job to build the temple. One of your own line will build your temple. But there's another huge promise that comes to David. Is that one of David's line, one from the line of David, will establish the kingdom forever. And David's line forever. And I just want you to file that away because that's quite important. The reading then jumps forward to 2 Samuel 11. And in 2 Samuel 11, we have this terrible story of David sinning sexually with Bathsheba. And I know we spoke about it a little bit when we looked at Psalm 51, but I think it would be doing the passage a disservice if we didn't come to this again, because it's such an important story for so many reasons. When I was younger, my dad was taking a, a, a youth group week uh, in the summer and he worked through the story of David and uh, I'm going to use some of his points from 2 Samuel 11 because they struck, they stuck with me when I was a young boy and, uh, and I still remember them. So we read this in verse 1. In the springs when kings march out to war, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel. So the first thing we see is that David was not doing what he should have been doing. David was not walking in the plans of God. He was not doing the things ordained for him by God. He was deviating from the plan of God. And when we step outside of God's plan, there is potential danger for us. And we read in verse 2, One evening David got up from his bed. So he's either lazing about or trying to sleep. He is not engaged. He is not working. He is not doing the things that he should be doing. And when we are in that situation, we are more susceptible to temptation. When we are not doing the things we are supposed to be doing. And David is strolling about the roof and he sees a beautiful woman. Now there is nothing wrong with seeing a beautiful woman and David had the chance to walk away. But David doesn't walk away. He indulges this even more and he finds out about her and then he sends for her and then he has an adulterous sexual relationship with her. And the way Dad had summarised this was David saw, David sent and David sinned. And then Bathsheba, the woman he's committed adultery with, sends a message to him to say that she's pregnant. So David calls her husband back from the battle. And he said, you know, he says, you know, gives him a meal and says, go and enjoy your wife, in other words. But Uriah is a man of honour and he doesn't. He sleeps with the other servants. So David then gets him drunk and Uriah still doesn't go. So David then sends a letter with Uriah to Joab, his commander, to say, put Uriah at the the front of the battle so that he is killed. And so Joab sends Uriah and other men to the front of the battle, and Uriah and these other men are killed. And Joab is worried because not only is Uriah killed, but the other men are killed, and he sends word back to David to say, I'm I'm, I'm sorry. And in, in chapter 11... David says this to him, don't, verse 25, don't let this matter upset you because the sword devours all alike. So David has committed mans- he's committed adultery and now manslaughter and he has caused one of his commanders to be involved in this. And well might we remember what God says in verse 27, the Lord considered what David has done to be evil. Evil. Despite success, despite promises, despite David receiving a glimpse of the holiness of God when Uzzah touched the ark and David being afraid of the power of God, he has completely abandoned God's commandments. 
And in chapter 12, Nathan comes to him and tells him a story about sheep. And David is outraged. And Nathan says, you are the man. And then David says this, sorry, Nathan says this to David in verse 7. This is what the Lord God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel and I rescued you from Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. And I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that was not enough, I would have given you even more. Why then have you despised the Lord's commands by doing what I consider evil? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife as your own. You murdered him with the Ammonite sword. Now therefore the sword will never leave your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own wife. This is what the Lord says. I am going to bring disaster on you from your own family. I will take your wives and give them to another before your very eyes and he will sleep with them in broad daylight. You acted in secret, but I will do this before all Israel and in broad daylight. David responded to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. The Nathan replied to David, And the Lord has taken away your sin. You will not die. However, because you treated the Lord with such contempt in this matter, the son born to you will die. Then Nathan went home. So the consequences of David's sin are terrible. David is confronted with his sin and he recognises that he has sinned against God. But there will be consequences in judgment from this sin. The sword will never leave David's family. The family will be ripped apart. David did this in secret. But God will display this sin for everyone to see. And not only that, the child that resulted from this sin will die. And if we leave the story there the questions that we would have would be very difficult to process and difficult to to accept. And so the baby is struck ill and David fasts and prays, but the baby is not spared. And his men come to tell him, but they are scared to tell him because David is so upset. But David, sensing something is wrong, says to them, is he dead? And they reply, he is. And in verse 20 we read this. David got up from the ground. He washed, anointed himself, changed his clothes, went to the Lord's house and worshipped. And his servant said to him in 21, Why have you done this while the baby was alive? You fasted and wept, but when he died you got up and ate food. And David says, While the baby was alive, I fasted and wept because I thought, who knows, the Lord may be gracious to me and let him live. But now that he is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will never return to me. So David acknowledges his sin, the consequences of his sin. And rather than rebelling against God, He goes and worships God and restores his relationship with God. And his servants find this mystifying because he is not fasting anymore. And David says this, and this is a very, very important verse for us to understand. I will go to him. He will never return to me. David's relationship with God had been restored. David knew that his eternal destiny was with God. The child was not judged because of its sin. And the child was preserved eternally in the presence of God. So humanly speaking, there is a tragedy here. And that the child is taken from David and Bathsheba. But the child is not destroyed because the God of the earth 
will do right. Because God is a God of justice and a God of love. And God spares the child and the child is kept in eternity and does not suffer for the sins of his father and mother. Now why do we look at these stories and why are they important? They are important because it highlights several things. David was the best of the best. David was as good as you could get. But he stepped outside of God's will. He didn't do what he was supposed to do. And he spiralled down a pathway of sin. For which consequences would come. But within that, God still came to David. God still gave David a chance to repent. God honoured the promises he made to David. David's throne was established forever because one of David's sons, the ultimate son, the ultimate king, would come and pay the price for David's sin. You see, these stories point us to the absolute perfection and holiness of God and the abhorrence of sin within the Trinity. But we are not left like that. We have a Saviour who comes. We have a means of restoration. And if we think about the ark and the holiness and not being able to go anywhere near it as we did when we were going through Leviticus. The ultimate son of David, the ultimate king, is the one who enables us to enter the presence of God, to worship him, to be forgiven and to be restored and have an eternal security with him. So my plea is don't step outside the plan of God. When you are confronted with sin, be like Joseph and run away. Don't indulge it. There was so many times when David could have stepped back. Step back from the sin. Ask God to help. Engage with the process of sanctification. And remember that God's holiness is so different from us. But his plan of redemption is so perfect and so great that we are allowed to enter and be in relationship with him as a child is with a father. So we are no longer afraid but can enter with boldness into the presence of God. Let's pray. Father, some of these stories are difficult to process. Some of these things are difficult to understand. But we acknowledge our need of your forgiveness as we are confronted with your holiness. We are aware of our need of salvation, of being purified by the death of your son and his blood shed. Father, help us to run from sin. Help us to be sanctified to you and become more Christ-like. Please help the Holy Spirit to lead us in all truth to transform, renew our minds and to display the fruit that would show a godly character and love. For we ask this in the precious name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Good night everybody, God bless and see you soon. Thank you for joining us. To find out more about Tayside Christian Fellowship, visit TCF Perth dot org dot uk together we worship jesus and communicate his love in all we do and say